Good morning to our wonderful audience and welcome back to Batiks on Wednesdays after the Easter weekend. Hope you all had a restful break and well-deserved time spent with family and friends. Your attendance on these sessions and support are always deeply appreciated. Compared to the developed world, emerging markets have been some of the worst performers over the past decade. But when cycles turn, they can add significant value to client portfolios. Very few global equity general funds look at emerging markets specifically. And if you think there is value looking to diversify away from developed markets, you will likely have to include this as explicit holding in client portfolios. That's the reason why I'll be looking at emerging markets or growth funds this morning. Today, we will cover the Southern Right Capital, BCI, GQG, Emerging Markets Equity Feeder Fund, run by Rajiv Jain from GQG, based in the US. They recently also won the Morningstar Manager of the Year Award for consistency, consistently delivering on risk-adjusted returns. We will also look at the BCI Sands Capital Emerging Markets Feeder Fund and Growth Fund, presented by Jack Meyer, Director and Head of Portfolio Specialist Team at the Sands Capital, and how they approach, approach growth investing. Looking for businesses that can sustain earnings growth globally and in emerging markets. Ian Barnes from Sands Capital will also be in the call. As this is in webinar format, we will unfortunately not take any live questions today. But as per usual, you are more than welcome to post questions during the session in the Q&A bubble, which we will get answered by the various fund managers and return to you as soon as possible. Thank you, Olga. Hi, I'm Jack Mayer. And I'm a director and head of the portfolio specialist team at Sands Capital. And at my role, I work closely with the portfolio managers on the global growth and emerging markets growth funds that are available on the BCI platform. Today, I'm thankful for the opportunity to share our perspectives on both the market as well as the global growth portfolio. Before doing so, I wanted to provide a brief reintroduction to who we are at Sands Capital, how we think, uh, because I believe that that is going to provide some helpful context uh, for the remainder of the presentation. So at Sands Capital, we are an independent investment manager based right outside of Washington, DC, and for the past 30 plus years, we've done solely one thing, which is seek to invest in the world's leading innovative growth businesses. In terms of our capabilities, we offer portfolios that focus on opportunity sets, from venture capital to public equity, from the United States to emerging markets, and really everything in between. But regardless of all of those portfolios and solutions that we offer for investors, each of them is underpinned by our singular philosophy and approach, which in turn is based on two key observations that we have about the market. The first is that over very long periods of time, earnings growth or company's fundamentals tend to explain the value of that company. And also over really long periods of time, a select few companies are responsible for most of the growth in the market. And so therefore, we focus our bottom-up research on trying to identify those few businesses that are capable of sustaining an above-average earnings growth rate over the long term. And we take a business owner's perspective to investing. We're not stock traders, we're business owners. And that informs everything that we do from return generation to risk mitigation. So with that brief overview of who we are and how we think at Sands Capital, let's dive into our perspectives on the market. And so I don't need to tell anyone on this call that 2024 is off to a great start and we've seen a continuance of the momentum uh, from 2023, but different from 2023 are the drivers of that market. And so this slide simply shows the Russell 1000 growth index versus the 10 year treasury yield. And as you can see in 2022 and 2023, these lines tended to run opposite from each other. They were uncorrelated, which meant that, or it's one indication that macro was more of the driver of the equity market returns. Now, this year has been interesting in 2024 in that yields are up, as are the indexes, which 
demonstrates to us that macro is being less of an influence and it might actually be micro factors or company specific fundamentals that are really explaining the returns of the market. Now, any discussion of the equity market wouldn't be complete without uh, looking at the Magnificent Seven. And as you all, I'm sure, are, are aware, uh, this group of stocks really traded as a group over the last few years, each of which outperforming the market, and this seven group of companies being seen as kind of this single entity. But interestingly, what we've seen this year is uh, diverging fortunes for this group. And so from left to right, NVIDIA to Tesla, they've had very different uh, stock outcomes, and that's actually largely followed their fundamental outcomes. And here we are plotting the stock returns for those seven businesses, along with the changes in consensus analyst estimates for both the near term and the long term. And I think that this chart is really great at illustrating a couple things. One is that we're starting to see some additional market breadth. And so we're not seeing this narrow leadership that we did see. We're seeing diversion fortunes, and it's largely based on the fundamentals of the, of the individual businesses themselves. And so when we take these two slides together, what we're seeing uh, is more of a micro-driven environment, some more dispersion, some discernment based on the fundamentals. And that suggests to us that not only is the rise in markets perhaps of a stronger quality, but it may also be a little bit more sustainable than what we saw in 2023. So those are some brief comments on the market, but what's really important to remember in the global growth portfolio and with our style of investing at Sands Capital is that we don't really care so much about the market. What we care about are the 34 businesses that we own in this portfolio. And this map slide uh, is a visual representation of where these businesses are and what they are. And I'm sure that many of them are familiar faces as enablers of the AI-led new industrial revolution. And some of these businesses may be less familiar as ones that are really focused on the emerging middle-class consumer or the consolidation and uh, formalization of, of industry. And so this is our global growth portfolio to now, uh, today. And if there's one takeaway that I'd like you to have from, from this presentation about this portfolio, it's that of underappreciated fundamental improvement. So what exactly does that mean? Here's a view of our portfolio. And as you can see on the left side, this is the percentage of the portfolio that was invested in loss-making companies uh, at the market peak in 2021. And what you'll see is that it was about a fifth of the portfolio at that time. Since then, that percentage has come down significantly to less than 5%. And importantly, this isn't just window dressing where we decided to exit all of the loss makers and purchase new businesses. We actually continue to own a lot of these businesses. And so what's actually happened underneath the hood is that there have been operational improvements that have been made, efficiencies and other industry trends that have occurred, creating an inflection in margins and profit power for the businesses that we own. And importantly, that inflection in margin hasn't come at the expense of above average earnings growth. What we have on the right side of this chart is the consensus estimated growth over the next three to five years. And as you can see, this portfolio is still expected to grow almost at twice the rate of the broader index. So what you're getting is effectively a portfolio that has a better profit profile, which as we know, leads investment results over the long term, as well as continuing to demonstrate high levels of growth. And what has this resulted in? Strong investment results that have been underpinned by earnings growth. And so this chart is demonstrating that the returns for the portfolio versus the MSCI Acqui index uh, from the end of 2022 until February of this year. Um, two observations that I have is that not only has global growth significantly outperformed the index over that time, but the composition or the driver of that performance has been higher quality because it's been almost entirely led by earnings growth with very little amount of multiple expansion. The opposite can be is true uh, of the index, as you can see. 
So I thought it might be helpful to provide a case study in terms of how this is really happening under the hood. You know, what's what's an example of, of what we're talking about here with this fundamental improvement? And I wanted to give an example with DoorDash, which is the leading food delivery provider in the US. Um, you know, this might be akin to uh, checkers delivery people locally on their motorbikes, connecting consumers uh, with restaurants and food delivery. And so with the business DoorDash, we think that there's three interconnected elements that have really been driving margin inflection for this business and, and ultimately profitability. Um, the first being falling competitive intensity. And so since 2019, we've seen the end of free money and a rationalization of competition. You know, peers are no longer popping up and just trying to grow at any cost. There's really been more of a focused effort on growth that's sustainable and profitable. And as that growth has, or that competition has rationalized, it's enabled the market leaders like DoorDash to entrench their positions, what makes it even harder for new competitors to enter the market. And during that time, as you can see, DoorDash has gone from roughly a third of the market of the US market share uh, to commanding you know, more than half of it, 60%. And what that market share leadership then enables is less spending on things like uh, discounting or aggressive marketing, which feeds into the next point, which is improving unit economics. You know, back in 2019, DoorDash was losing money on every order. And today, as you can see, uh, it's making $2.31 on every order. And so over that time period, not only is the business, because of its falling competitive intensity, not having to spend so much on marketing dollars or driving promotions, but customers have formed new habits. Their order frequency is going up. They're using the app. They're, they're engaging more with the app. Uh, there's, they've also been able to improve the density of their delivery network to ensure that orders are, are happening faster and with fewer errors, so uh, less of a reason to offer refunds. And so all of that is working together to make every single order more profitable. And then finally, it's expansion into new products, which not only helps the growth profile for driving orders, but also profitability because these new products are being layered on top of the infrastructure that's already been built. And so an example of this is DoorDash, uh, not only connecting uh, its users with restaurants, but also enabling them to order sundry items or groceries. And when we initially invested in this business, you know, we didn't always view it as just a food delivery app. What we really thought was that it was a hyper-local logistics network, and we're beginning to see that really play out, and it's possible that we see even additional use cases beyond those that are food-related using this network of local uh, delivery providers. And so these three elements, uh, as we've set up on the screen here with a kind of a math equation, are resulting in accelerating earnings potential. And what you can see is that back in 2019, the net margin for this business was, was quite abysmal. But today, you know, we're approaching break even and over our investment horizon, we expect net margins to continue to grow uh, and to approach 20%. One other thing that I'd like to highlight about this portfolio is its financial strength and the financial strength of, of the businesses within. Uh, a recession, as we all know, didn't materialize in 2023, as almost every economist forecasted. Um, but regardless, if and when one does arise, we are very confident in our business's ability to make their own weather. And so what this uh, slide is showing is that our business is, compared to the broader MSCI Acqui Index, have net cash positions and higher structural margins, which in turn enables more ability to invest in their operations, to fortify their competitive moats, to explore those new uh, product areas and, and services to address their clients, which that in turn can underpin above average earnings growth potential for, for the companies. And so if you harken back to our criteria and how we think about investing, the businesses that we seek are less vulnerable to the macro cycle. They're industry leaders and they're underpinned by more secular demand for the products and services. And that naturally leads them to operate in less cyclical uh, industries with 
less commoditized products. And ultimately, they don't have much of a need for uh, borrowing or external financing. And all of these things really matter and become a competitive advantage in and of themselves uh, in more of a, a tumultuous macro environment. And so if that is something that we find ourselves in in, in the future, um, we have confidence in our business's ability to continue to invest in themselves and to expand their moats. Now, up until this point, we've discussed how uh, the businesses that we own are improving their fundamentals, how they have strong financial strength, but let's turn to why we believe that's underappreciated today. And so here we have a slide that's showing um, effectively the peg ratio or uh, the growth adjusted valuation for our portfolio. And with this portfolio, as we've discussed, you get the earnings growth potential and financial strength that's well in excess of the index, but without paying a premium. And at a company level beneath the surface, over 40% of the holdings actually trade at a lower forward PE today than they did at the end of 2022. And that's despite the portfolio uh, performing so strongly over that period. So that concludes my prepared remarks for today. Uh, I wanna thank you for your time. And in the future, when you think about Sands Capital, I would really like you to associate us with growth investing, with earnings power, with business ownership, and specifically to this portfolio with that underappreciated fundamental improvement. The great financials journalist, Jim Grant, has this great quote that's successful investing is about having everyone agree with you, but later. And this is the opportunity that we have today with global growth, with so many of the businesses that we own having improved underneath the surface and yet not being fully recognized for that improvement by the market. So thank you again for your time and we'll see you next time. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, Eugene, thank you for giving us the opportunity to talk to you about um, the GQG, uh, the Sunrise Capital GQG Emerging Market Equity Fund, as well as the uh, Sunrise Capital BCI GQG Global Equity Fund. Um, as everybody know, these are the two um, South African Rand feeder funds that we've made available to South African investors from May 2022 for the global strategies, and then from um, January 2023 on the emerging market equity strategies. Um, as we only have 15 minutes, um, I'm joined by Chilanta de Silva. Um, everybody know Chilanta. He's been on the calls, and we'll also see you in May at, at the BCI conference. Um, and he will give us portfolio insights in terms of how the portfolios have developed over time, but also as um, GKG's emerging market equity, as well as global equity funds are positioned um, for the year ahead. Um, I'm going to share with you a few slides um, before I hand over to Chilanta. Um, so the history um, of Sunrise Capital and GKG go back as far as 2017. Um, and um, what Sunrise Capital do in our partnerships is we form long-term relationships with what we think are the most sophisticated and experienced portfolio managers around the world. Um, we've got both the um, global as well as the emerging market equity fund available directly into the users funds, but also in an easy investable form through the South African RAND feeder funds. Um, if one look at the performance of the global fund since that inception in May 2022, you will see on a RAND basis, as this fund is denominated, there's been north of 1,800 basis points of outperformance since the inception of this fund. Um, we have an analyzed performance of close to 30%, where the benchmark did just over 10%. Um, as it is for the Emerging Market Equity Fund, it's um, also due to very active um, portfolio management, um, both in terms of country selection as well as um, stock selection, 
um, the emerging market equity fund have seen a significant outperformance where the fund have uh, since inception in January 2023 produced almost 40% on an absolute basis and have a outperformance of 37% where the benchmark has just uh, done about uh, just over 1% in, in, in an absolute number. So we're very pleased um, since Jalanta and I first told you about the thesis or described the thesis of um, how the forward looking quality process work. Um, things have panned out and played out um, in line with the expectations that we've set at the time. Um, on a quick longer term basis, if you have a look here, um, the firm performance since inception on the Global Emerging Market Fund has been an outperformance north of 600 basis points. Um, and on the Global Equity Fund, there's a 400 basis points of outperformance. So um, we are very pleased with these return characteristics, especially as it, look, uh, as it um, protects capital on the downside. Um, and, and please note that these numbers are reflective of the strategy performance, but it's very much in line with the usage performance. Um, as you will see, there's a good protection during down troughs that um, result in these very good um, relative outperformance numbers um, over the longer term um, as capital get protected on the downside. Um, with that, I'll hand over to Jalanta because I know there's two things that um, really interest um, all money managers, the first being performance and the second being stocks. So with that, Jalanta, if, um, I can hand over to you. Thank you, Gideon. So what you this slide shows you is how flexible the strategy is. What we're aiming to do is to get you the strongest call it 50 to 55 global or emerging market franchises to own at any given time. This means that we are going to focus on the quality of earnings. And I'm simplifying the process when I say this, we are buying improving earnings and we are vacating areas of deteriorating earnings. And this is what you see in terms of how quickly the portfolio has changed and transitioned given the shifting landscape in terms of earnings, visibility, um, and growth. Today, we have substantially increased our exposure to technology, and that's reflective of the earnings growth and visibility that's coming through. NVIDIA is a name that you see right on top. Uh, this is a name that we've owned in the past. We reintroduced it in March of 23. Today, the numbers look even more compelling, considering that when you look at the AI landscape, we're at a very, very early innings in terms of the build-out. There's been a trillion dollars of data center capex in the last decade. All this needs to get accelerated. There's 300 billion of incremental capex on an annualized basis. Uh, which is going to also have uh, a need for acceleration or AI um, capabilities. And NVIDIA plays directly into that opportunity set. They have a substantial market share. They have quasi-monopoly-like uh, um, positioning given the technology and the infrastructure they have. They're transitioning into a software opportunity set as well, which implies stronger margin outlooks and the valuations are still quite reasonable. Today, when you look at one year forward earnings, uh, price to earnings multiples, NVIDIA is as cheap or expensive as Walmart, which is growing at a fraction of the pace of NVIDIA. How we have stacked our tech exposure is in three components. One is the picks and shovels for this opportunity set, which is semiconductor and semiconductor equipment. Two are the big platforms that house the data. They will democratize AI to the masses. So this transcends across technology, which is Microsoft and Meta, income services, Amazon, and discretionary. And 
the third component is the application layer or the software space that will help in broad basing the AI opportunity set and stepping into that efficiency layer that one gets to. The positive of the migration from this build out phase to the application and then efficiency is that you will see a vast swath of the economy benefiting from this, but this will come with substantial disruption risk. I think every company in every sector is at risk of disruption. So this traditional buy and hold philosophy a lot of managers have is at risk because you could be holding to extinction. The other areas that we have is energy and healthcare. And, uh, we have actually receded in the exposures in both these areas due to the fact that we find better opportunities in tech. Our energy um, thesis has gotten stronger because of the demand coming from AI. And AI data center consumes about 100x more energy than a traditional data set. I'm talking 10 megawatts to one gigawatt. That quantum uh, uh, is the change. And therefore, our energy exposure today doesn't reflect our optimism. And that's partly given the valuation we have seen energy stocks capture in the last 24 months, uh, but also the more compelling opportunities in tech versus that in energy at this juncture. Um, I'm pretty sure that we our energy exposure will go up um, as time goes on. The other area is healthcare. We all the big molecule players like a Eli Lilly, a, uh, a Nora Nordisk, they play into the obesity uh, drug space. We have very early innings there as well. You're looking at, you know, if you, the numbers, are conservative because even today the expectation is only about 15 million of the 150 million Americans. I'm not even taking global numbers. Americans, obese Americans will have access to these drugs um, with a TAM of around 60 billion. So as capacity increases, penetration increases, I think there is um, headroom and growth. There is better products coming through, which will make it... Um, uh, uh, less cumbersome in terms of usage, right? The efficiency of these products, they will turn into oral products, which means you're not injecting yourself and you are uh, going to have uh, a broad basing there too. So all these positives lend us to owning some key uh, players in the healthcare space. Um, and then I think, as I mentioned earlier, as the application layer seeps in and efficiency comes in, you will see our portfolio reflecting that improving margin profile across a multitude of sectors. The other area that we're quite optimistic on is emerging markets. Um, this is EMX China. Again, China at, at a macro level is fine, but at a micro level become very hard to underwrite given the adoption of common prosperity. But it's not just what's happening in China. It's also the fact that you're seeing really strong earnings coming from other parts of emerging markets, case in point, um, India, right? Um, the reform process has really amplified growth and it's a structural outcome. Uh, the quality of growth is improving, the risks are diminishing and lots of EM is seeing a very good pattern of, of uh, sovereign consolidation uh, fiscal consolidation. This is coming from the fact that EM is naturally over-indexed to commodities. Commodities are very well anchored. And that's allowing these uh, countries to dollarize the sovereign balance sheet. And that's leading to a much more solvent banking system with improving labor productivity. So a combination of all this makes EM um, very compelling. That's getting reflected in our global portfolio as well as our EM exposure is notching higher. Um, so let me pause there and um, looking forward to seeing everybody in May.
Thank you, Jalanta. And um, yeah, just if one have a quick look here at the portfolio, I, hopefully a, a few key messages come through. Um, we definitely don't want to sound like a group that sell you performance because past performance is in the past. And um, what the portfolio uh, is looking to extrapolate out of the market is forward looking quality. Um, on a quick name basis, um, uh, well, it's hopefully evident that um, concentration among top 10 names remain to be the same, um, if not higher, um, as we now sitting in 2024 versus 36 months back, where the top 10 holdings are representing about 56% of the portfolio. Um, another point that's hopefully coming through is the, um, the active management. Um, so in active management, we look for two things, one being conviction and concentration, and secondly, um, the active management around that. Um, if one look only 12 months back, there's only one name in overlapping, um, which is Petrobras. And if one look um, 36 months back, there's four names in overlap. But clearly, a lot of things happened over the past 36 months um, around the portfolio. Um, we, as with Jalanta, looking forward to speaking to you as a group in May. Um, in the meantime, if there's any questions, feel free to reach out either through BCI or directly to myself. Um, and yeah. Thank you for the time. Thank you all for joining us on this webinar today. We will get the questions received, answered as soon as possible, and circulated to all those of you who attended. Feel free to contact the BCR sales team if you have any more questions or need information on the funds that we covered from GQG and Sands Capital. Looking forward and seeing all of you back next week, Wednesday the 10th of April, where we will cover local and global property with Retway Global, Cess for Kila Capital, and Visio Fund Management. Thank you all, and see you soon.